So I'm pleased to introduce to you and bring to you this evening, Dr. Kenton Morgan. Dr. Morgan graduated from the University of Missouri's College of Veterinary Medicine in 1983, and he became a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists in 1993. He practiced equine medicine for 11 years before joining Bayer Animal Health, where he was a senior technical services veterinarian. And following this, he managed the equine field professional services team at Fort Dodge Animal Health prior to joining Zoetis in 2010. Dr. Morgan has served as a member of the board of directors of the American Association of Equine Practitioners and currently serves on the research committee of the American Quarter Horse Association, along with his memberships in numerous other veterinary organizations. He speaks across the country to veterinary groups on equine reproduction, infectious disease control and prevention strategies, parasite control, antimicrobial use, pain control, and sedation in horses. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenton Morgan. Dr. Morgan, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you, Dr. Esser. And uh, I want to thank the whole team at Michigan State for helping to organize this. And thank you to each of the participants who joined in this evening. So we're going to we're going to kind of roll through this and what I would like to do at the you know towards the end of this we're going to open it up for questions and and we'll have an opportunity then to answer some of your questions and I'm just really pleased that we have some real veterinarians on with us tonight uh, that being Dr. Stracota and and Dr. Esser uh, to really help answer the hard questions if if we get some of those so our our main focus tonight we want to review some of the important equine diseases and I'll have a little bit of a focus on Michigan per se, but a lot of this is going to apply across the country because I know we have many participants outside of the state of Michigan. And so uh, this will be a, applicable to all of you. And I'm gonna talk specifically about the core diseases and we'll go over exactly what that means. And then I was also asked, asked to spend a little bit of time on strangles, um, infectious bacterial disease that most everyone is familiar with. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well. And then towards the end, I'm going to just discuss some vaccination expectations. What, you know, as horse owners, we need to know about vaccines and vaccine use. And then uh, just some very basic biosecurity or preventative strategies. And, and then that'll conclude the program and we'll open it up for questions. So with that, we'll get started tonight. And again, I want to thank everyone for, for allowing us to participate. One term I'm going to use, you'll hear me talk about tonight is, is a zoonotic disease. And exactly what that is, just, just as the slide reads there, it is an infectious disease that is transmitted between species from animals to people, or it can be from people to animals. But we're, some of the diseases we're gonna talk about tonight are truly zoonotic diseases. So just want you to, to understand that term and I'll, I'll spell out some of these terms as we go through them as well. So with that, we'll talk about the core diseases or sometimes we refer to them as core vaccines. But they're core diseases and they have then, of course, their, their associated vaccines to prevent those diseases. Core vaccines are considered to be necessary for all horses, no matter what they do for a living or no matter where you live or where those horses live. So whether you've got a backyard horse that never sees any other equine of any type, or you've got a horse that you're loading in the trailer every week and hauling to a competition or taking to a trail ride, whatever the case may be, all horses need to be protected against the core diseases. And so these core diseases slash vaccines that go with those, first, first of all is the West Nile virus. Everyone I think is familiar with the West Nile virus. Then we'll talk about Eastern equine encephalitis, or we just abbreviate that triple E. And then Western equine encephalitis, uh, double E, and, or excuse me, W double E, and collectively refer to those two diseases as sleeping sickness. So most everyone's heard of sleeping sickness and we collectively lump Eastern equine encephalitis and Western equine encephalitis together for that. And then we also are gonna talk about tetanus. Uh, most everyone's heard of tetanus. One of the, the uh, diseases we've had vaccines, probably the oldest vaccine that we give horses today dates back to, to the first tetanus vaccine. And then we're gonna talk about rabies a little bit. And, and like I said, lastly, we'll talk about strangles. Strangles is not a core disease. It's what we call a risk-based disease. So these five 
are the core diseases or the core vaccines that go with those diseases. And then everything else that we talk about in horses, typically we lump under risk-based diseases or their risk-based vaccines. And just as the name implies, that term refers to, okay, what's the risk for this disease with respect to your horse? I said that the core diseases, every horse should receive vaccines against the core diseases. Not so with the risk base. So some horses may be at quite high risk, especially those horses that were campaigning hard, they're interacting with other horses. The age of the horse also can indicate what type of risk-based vaccines they need in addition to the core vaccines, um, what they do for a living. Pregnant broodmares will have a different set of vaccines than a young performance horse. And they will have different vaccine programs than, again, that backyard animal that is pretty much by itself, rarely comes into contact with other equine. So with that, we'll kind of jump in and talk about these a little bit. So why do we refer to these as core diseases? And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Well, first of all, these all have quite high mortality rates. And mortality, as we understand that term, uh, to put it in better perspective, if you have 100 horses and they're all exposed to disease X and 10 of them die, then that would be a mortality rate of 10%, right? Now, we also sometimes use a term called morbidity rates. And morbidity has to do with how many horses actually get sick when they're exposed to a particular disease. So if we have 100 horses, expose them all to disease X and um, 20 of them become ill, then that would be a 20% morbidity rate. So little difference between mortality and morbidity rate. Mortality are the number of horses that actually die from the disease. Morbidity are the number of horses that actually develop clinical signs of disease if they're exposed. So these five core diseases all have very high mortality rates. And uh, triple E or Eastern Equine Encephalitis is 90%. So in other words, nine out of 10 horses that come down with this disease will die. So it's got very, very high mortality rates. Western Equine Encephalitis, which is not nearly as prevalent as the East, as its Eastern cousin, if you will, there are two different viruses, but they're closely related, has about a 50% mortality rate, which indeed is still very significant. Tetanus, about 75% mortality rate. West Nile, about one in three. So about 33% to 35% of horses that come down with clinical signs of West Nile will die from that disease. And then rabies, of course, it is 100%. There is no treatment for rabies. Once they develop clinical signs of disease, then they are considered hopeless. There is no remedy. There is no treatment for them. And so it is 100% mortality disease, and that's uh, very significant. And then the other thing we'll talk about too, of course, are the vaccinations for these diseases. And, and all of these diseases, it's recommended that we booster our horses annually for them. So the core diseases, so why do we prefer them? Just as we said, they all have very high mortality rates and all horses can potentially be exposed regardless of where they live or what they do for a living, okay? Three of those diseases, we'll talk about these, West Nile, Eastern and Western, they're viral diseases and they're all spread by mosquitoes, right? Tetanus, that is a disease, it's actually a bacterial disease, so caused by a bacteria. And the, there's a very, uh, there's a spore form, a, a very uh, inert or inactive form of that bacteria that lives in the soil, okay? And wherever we have livestock, equine species, Many of these organisms are normal inhabitants of the digestive tract of the horse and they're passed into the environment and then they survive for long periods of time within the environment, basically in the soil, in manure, in this spore form. And so if you got horses walking around on the ground, they can potentially be ex exposed to these clostridial tetani spores. So there again, all horses potentially exposed all horses are potentially exposed to mosquitoes. I don't care how tight your barn is, how much spray we put on them, uh, they are still can be exposed to mosquitoes. And then lastly, rabies, we'll talk about that one, of course, too. Wildlife vector, many different uh, wildlife species can, can uh, harbor that virus and pass it on to horses. And we'll discuss that, but there again, I don't care how tight your barn is, uh, all horses go out sometime 
and they're potentially exposed to these wildlife vectors. So every horse is potentially exposed to all five of these core diseases. And then there are vaccines which are available and they are all highly effective against these five core diseases. So whether it's Eastern, whether it's West Nile, whether it's tetanus, whether it's rabies, the vaccines that we have on the market, and, and I don't care whose brand you use, they're all very, very, what we call efficacious or very effective at preventing these diseases. And then some of these diseases can have significant public health risk. And primarily there, we're talking about rabies. Now, several of these are zoonotic diseases, but only rabies of these five diseases we're talking about. Rabies is the only one that we could actually, that a human could actually get from their horse that has come down with rabies, okay? And I'll discuss that and how that works. Bottom line here, because we have these vaccines and they're recommended that every horse get them each year, regardless of what they, you know, where we keep them or what they do, no horse should ever die from one of these core diseases. Now, granted, no vaccine is 100%. I understand that. And I think all of us do. But horses that are properly immunized, very, very, very rarely ever come down with one of these five diseases. Okay, so let's talk about those a little bit. The first one is tetanus. The organism is called Clostridium tetani. The old term that we're all familiar with, I think, or most of us are, at least it's called lockjaw. That's the, the term that we've used for many years and, and still do. And again, this is a bacteria that resides in the soil where we keep animals. So all horses are potentially at risk. And typically how these horses are exposed when we have puncture wounds, lacerations, sole abscesses, sometimes newborn foals can be exposed through the, the, the umbilicus when it's still wet and it hasn't dried yet. Excuse me. So any of those types of open wounds is a potential access for these clostridial spores. Now, the thing about clostridium organisms, and there's a bunch of them, you know, uh, clostridium botulinum or botulism, everyone's heard of that, right? Very potent, it's, it's kind of a cousin. It's another member of this family of clostridial bacteria. But these clostridial no, or clostridia bacteria are known for producing very, very potent toxins. So it's actually not the bacteria that kills the horse, it's the toxin that the bacteria produces that will kill the horse. And so it, it really interferes with the nervous system, with how the nerves innervate the muscles and, and, and make everything work properly. And so what eventually happens, these toxins, they will, uh, they will have impact on the nerves and ultimately they impact the effect of the nerves on the muscles. And, and that's one of the reasons we see these horses quiver and shake, or if you clap your hands real loud, sometimes um, it'll put them into kind of almost looks like a convulsion. And, and that has to do with how these toxins interfere with the normal function of the nerves and the muscles. And ultimately they will get paralysis and, and, and they will die. They will get paralysis of the diaphragm that allows them to breathe and, and as well as even the heart muscle eventually. And these horses die really hard. This is not a pretty disease to ever uh, experience. And so most of these horses, uh, we will end up euthanizing them for humane reasons. So many of them will, uh, you know, if, if, if we don't jump on them very, very early for treatment, they, they don't have too much of a chance. Treatment is very challenging. It's difficult. Uh, it's very time consuming, labor intensive. It's quite expensive. There's a lot of supportive care. And, and typically we'll use antibiotics as part of the treatment. The antibiotics really don't have any impact on the toxins, but they do, of course, on the bacteria that are producing the toxins. And then there is a tetanus antitoxin. It's, it's different than the tetanus vaccine. It's another product, an active antitoxin product that sometimes will help if we get it in the horses quite early. But again, the way to go with this disease is of course prevention through vaccination. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears. We're gonna talk about uh, some of the viral encephalitic diseases. And so that would be West Nile and Eastern and Western encephalitis or sleeping sickness. These have a pretty similar transmission cycle. They are transmitted by mosquitoes. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, that is, a, bunch of birds flying through the air there, of course, and many different species of birds can be what we call the natural reservoir host within nature that kind of harbors these viruses, okay? They may or may not have a negative impact on the health of the birds themselves, but these birds harbor these viruses. 
And as the virus is circulating through the bird and a mosquito takes a blood meal from that infected bird, it can pick up enough virus that then when it flies to the horse and takes a blood meal from the horse, in the process of getting that blood meal, that virus is exchanged and that's how the horse is exposed. Same way with us, you know, we can come down with equine encephalitis as well, people can also. We can't get it from our horse, but we can get it from the same mosquitoes who are feeding off the birds, okay? So it, it is a zoonotic disease, but it's not a zoonotic disease that we can contract from our horse. So West Nile, Eastern and Western are all very similar in that regard. The incubation period, that will vary from a few days to a couple of weeks. And all that means the incubation period is a time from when we're exposed to the pathogen until we develop clinical signs or clinical disease from that pathogen, okay? One good thing, if there is any good thing about these diseases with respect to the horse, the horse is considered what we call a dead end host. So the horse contracts the, one of these viruses from mosquitoes. If it is not vaccinated and it develops the disease, uh, other animals cannot contract West Nile or Eastern or Western from that individual animal, okay? The horse does not get a high enough, what we call a viremia or virus level in the blood that then a mosquito could take a blood meal from that horse and transmit it to another horse or even to another person, okay? So the, the disease is coming from the birds of via mosquitoes to our horse. All three of these diseases cause inflammation of the brain and or spinal cord, and really a more, a more appropriate term, I call them encephalitis. Actually, encephalomyelitis is a more appropriate term. And all that means, encephalomyelitis, anytime we see itis, on the end of a word, that means infection or infl inflammation of, right? Tonsillitis, um, we know that's inflammation of the tonsils. Well, here we have encephalomyelitis. Encephalo is referring to the head or brain. Myelo, that term is referring to the spinal cord. So basically we have an inflammation slash infection of the brain and spinal cord. Collectively, we call that the central nervous system, right? And with that, anytime we have infection of the central nervous system, we're gonna see some very, very serious um, signs of disease. We may see one or we may see all of these in a particular animal with these types of neurologic disease. But first, typically we're gonna see them, they're gonna become very weak or ataxic, which kind of looks like they're drunk. They're having trouble keeping their balance and moving around normally. Uh, usually there's, there's quite a bit of depression early on as well. They may run a fever. They may become re recumbent or get down. Once they get down, their chances of recovery are not very good. But muscle fasciculations is one of those things like muscle twitches, if you will, particularly on the front end of the horse, that's more exclusive to West Nile. You know, any of these horses with West Nile, Eastern or Western can see some of these um, or all of these signs, but the muscle fasciculations is more unique to West Nile itself. And then the other thing we need to remember, I talked about the mortality rates on these animals and some of them can survive, right? Except for rabies. But if they do survive, many of these may have permanent neurologic damage. So even though we salvage them, they may no longer be uh, good for their intended purpose. We may, may not be able to ride them or use them for what we'd like to, even though they've survived these diseases. So that's also important to consider. Just a little history, you know, 1999 is when West Nile first came to the United States and it was, it was diagnosed in some of the bird populations within the Bronx Zoo in New York. And actually a veterinarian was the one that, a veterinary pathologist was the one that identified West Nile and said, this is not like any viruses we've seen before in the United States. And since that time, over 27,000 horses in the United States have been affected by West Nile. That's what we know of. And there's many more thousand that were not reported that were also affected. And so in the early days when the disease was first moving across the country and we did not have a vaccine for it, there was um, significant, significant morbidity and mortality in this, what we would call a naive population of horses in the United States because they'd never seen this disease before. So their immune system was not prepared for it. And here, this is just some numbers. Uh, I got this off of USDA. Uh, data, just looking back to 
2006. And remember those uh, the years about oh, 2001 through 2004 were really, really the peak real high years. There was thousands of horses per year coming down with West Nile at that time. But you, what I want you to see, and you'll see this on some of the slides I have, I want you to see uh, the ups and downs of disease incidents with these, okay? They're very cyclic in nature, and that's true for almost all of these diseases. And that can be due to a number of different factors. It can be due to the weather, it can be due to the mosquito populations, it can be due to bird populations, their migratory routes. It can be due to wildlife vectors, you know, uh, we talk about rabies here in a minute. It, it, it can be due to impacts on bat populations in certain areas. So all these have multiple, multiple factors that add into the ability of that pathogen to cause disease within the equine population within any given year. And then over on this side, uh, let me move this out of my way here. Whoops. The numbers for uh, 2020 for West Nile cases are up. So we may be on another upswing looking at this graph going forward. So Eastern equine encephalitis or encephalomyelitis, it's foundation wide, but it gets its name because primarily it's east of the Mississippi River. And so it is called Eastern equine encephalomyelitis. But we see it from Florida. Florida is always a hotbed. We see usually more cases of Eastern equine encephalitis in Florida than about any other state. And like I said, mortality rates are up to 90% of these horses. I already talked about the uh, ability of, of these horses to transmit the disease to another horse via mosquitoes. We really don't see that. And that's a good thing because viremia, which just means virus in the blood, right? Viremia, virus in the blood. In horses, that virus load does not get high enough to uh, for a mosquito be able to take a blood meal and transmit enough virus to cause disease in another species. So that's a good thing. And here's some, some data on Eastern equine encephalitis looking at the last few years, looking at case reports. And the thing I want to remind you, and I mentioned this earlier, these are the cases we know of for sure. And for every one of these cases, there could be another one, two or three cases that are not reported or not confirmed. So these are very, very much baseline numbers. But here again, I want you to see the cyclicity of increases and decreases in numbers of these from year to year. That's why it's so important that we maintain a regular vaccination program for our animals. Now, if you get drilled down just a little bit, in 2020, there was 18 counties that reported uh, 38 cases of Eastern equine encephalitis. And that was up from 2019, there was 29 confirmed cases. And that year, Michigan actually had more cases than Florida of confirmed equine encephalitis. So Michigan is, is a state that's very familiar with triple E or sleeping sickness in horses because it probably has a lot to do with the, uh, you know, so much of the water uh, in the Michigan area. Uh, there again, bird populations, their migratory routes and the mosquito populations. So Western equine encephalitis, now we haven't seen a case for the last few years in the, in the US. That means the virus is still not out there circulating in the bird populations. We just haven't seen very many of those cases, which is a good thing. And that's also, you know, people, I get this question sometimes, hey, we haven't seen a case of this. Do we still need to keep vaccinating? I want you to think about that question. Hey, we haven't seen any of this lately. We've been vaccinating really well. Do we need to keep doing that? Yes, we do. And probably one of the big factors why we haven't seen very many cases lately is because we have been vaccinating our equine population. So we still wanna be vigilant about these diseases and keeping our vaccines up to date. And, and it gets its name because it's typically more west of the Mississippi River. So with respect to prevention for these mosquito-borne diseases, well, number one, we want to try to get rid of any stagnant water we have on our farms or in the locations where our horses are housed because that, that's breeding ground for mosquitoes, as you guys are aware. It takes about four days for the mosquito breeding cycle to occur for them to lay the eggs. And so it's a very, very short turnaround. Old tires and clutter like that are ideal. They are ideal habitat for these mosquitoes to breed and, and, and amplify their numbers. So we, we want to clean that all up on our premises if we have anything like that. Aerial spraying, we used to do that years ago, may or may not be uh, very valuable for many of these. Certainly there are topical sprays for the horses, 
Permethrins, they do have some repellent activities as well as some other sprays and, and they will help us. They're not a, a cure-all, but they will help us. Some of the fly sheets or nets, they, again, they, they're helpful. They're not gonna keep mosquitoes from, from landing on the horses, but they are, you know, as the horse moves and those nets move, uh, it does help keep the mosquitoes at bay a little bit. Now, if we can, and you're in really heavy mosquito season, it's nice to put the horses in stalls if you can, if it's practical, uh, because we'll see less mosquito burden there than many times outside. But if we do that, one thing that really, really helps us is to put fans in the stalls or on the horses, you know, on the outside of the doors, blowing on the horses. Those air movements, mosquitoes are very weak flyers. And so those air movements help keep the mosquitoes off the horses. And so that is a very useful thing in the barns. And then our lights, keeping the lights off because they attract all types of insects. Uh, and that's all helpful too. The vaccination there again, with respect to prevention, there is no tool as good as, as vaccination to prevent these diseases. All right, so we're gonna shift gears. We're gonna talk about rabies now. It's another viral disease but a very different type of transmission than the mosquito-borne diseases. And just some kind of sobering facts about rabies. Between 50 and 60,000 people in the United States every year are treated for post-exposure uh, to rabies or, or post-rabies exposure. In other words, you know, a dog has bitten them, maybe it's not current on its vaccination or they've come in contact with another animal, a, a fox has gotten in their house, a bat. Bats are notorious for carrying rabies. So they've gotten in the house and people may be exposed. And so then they have to go through post-exposure prophylactic treatment. It's very effective if you catch it early, um, but between 50 and 60,000 people do that at an average cost of about $7,500. So you can do the math. It's, it costs us about $250 million a year in post-exposure post human rabies prophylactic treatment every year. So it's rabies exposure is a big deal in the United States. Now worldwide, about almost 60,000 people die to rabies every year worldwide. Most of those are children as, ex, uh, as, as a result of their exposure in many times developing countries, exposure to canine or dogs that have not been vaccinated. Um, so uh, in the United States, we'll have about one to three human cases of rabies each year, which uh, there again, it's just a, a dreadful, dreadful disease. And so when we talk about neurologic disease and horses, you know, the old adage when, when I was going into vet school, and you, you see a neurologic case really of any kind, it was always think rabies first, think rabies first, because many, any disease that affects the central nervous system, the brain and or spinal cord, especially early on in the disease process, could mimic rabies. And the thing about rabies in horses, that's very interesting to me. We think, you know, it causes disease of the neurologic uh, system and, and we see the, the, the depression, all the things we talked about earlier, but early in the disease process, early in the disease process in horses, one of the most common, two of the most common clinical signs we will see on presentation of a horse with rabies is number one, colic or abdominal discomfort or something that looks like choke in the horse where they, you know, they, they've got something lodged in their esophagus and they can't swallow appropriately. Now, as the disease progresses and we'll get more and more very specific neurologic signs, then, you know, we take our, you know, our focus away, oh, this is not a routine colic. There's something else going on here. It could be rabies. But early on in the disease process, we don't always know that. And so what's one of the first things we do as veterinarians or even as a horse owner, when your horse has a bellyache? Well, we look at the mucous membranes. We, you know, we roll it slipped up in its mouth. We may pull the tongue out, look back there at the base of the tongue, make sure there's not anything in its mouth, those kind of things. And before we know it, we've been potentially exposed, right? Because we know that the rabies virus is transmitted through the saliva of an infected animal. And so this is where the the zoonotic potential is so very, very important because a person in their entire family could be exposed to a horse with rabies before we got our hand, arms around it and figured out that, oh my gosh, this is not a choke. This is not a colic. Uh, some horses present with shifting leg lameness with early rabies. So 
uh, it can be very deceiving early on in the disease process. But these horses typically go downhill quite rapidly. And, uh, and then it's, you know, it's much more clear to us that, oh my gosh, this is, this is a viral neurologic disease and we got to think about rabies. And of course, the only way to diagnose that, we have to submit the, the brain, a portion of the brain into the diagnostic lab to do testing on that. There's not a, there's not a blood test that we can take to tell us the horse has rabies. They're working on those things. We don't have them commercially available yet. And so uh, we have to submit the brain to get a confirmatory diagnosis. So that's uh, very heartbreaking in those cases. I talked about the, the wildlife vectors a little bit earlier on and, and the primary wildlife vectors in the United States are skunks, raccoons, bats, and foxes. And this will vary a little bit with your geography. So I think in Michigan, uh, skunks and bats are the predominant vectors and that's the same way uh, where I'm located here in Northwest Missouri. But certain areas in the Northeast, foxes are more of an issue and certain areas in the South, um, raccoons can be more of an issue. But these are the primary um, vectors. But certainly other animals can contract rabies and then can potentially spread it to other animals. Almost any mammal can potentially contract rabies. So any warm-blooded animal, uh, any mammal, warm-blooded animal could potentially uh, contract and then spread rabies. So we, we, we need to be aware of that. One of the best stories I've heard, this was at one of the veterinary schools, uh, very well experienced clinicians, a horse came in with a shifting rear limb lameness. So it'd be lame in the left and then it'd be kind of lame in the right. And it was kind of a slow developing disease. And so they'd had it in the clinic at the veterinary school for three days. And then it just went downhill and started looking like a more typical rabies case. And by the time they were all said and done, 17 students and faculty members had been exposed to that horse. So it just gives you an idea of the potential uh, with a horse with rabies. And if you look at the numbers, if you look at the number of dogs in the United States versus the number of canine rabies cases every year, and you look at the number of horses in the United States versus the number of equine rabies cases every year, a horse is about four times more likely to develop rabies than a dog is. So let that one sink in. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we really, really are stringent about vaccinating our dog or canine population. And we're not so diligent about vaccinating our equine population. So when we think about rabies, we think about the vicious form, right? And, and that is more common in the carnivore species. So if a dog comes down with rabies, it's more likely to be that more aggressive form. But the other form of rabies we see is what we call the dumb form. And that's more common in the herbivore species like the horse. So typically these horses are not aggressive, uh, although that's, you know, that, that can occur. But typically they're more the dumb where they're just very, very depressed begin to salivate a lot, have trouble swallowing, and, 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 and many of those other signs of neurologic disease that we mentioned earlier. And like I said, there is no treatment. Once the horse develops clinical signs of disease, they're going to die. So we want to lean heavily on vaccination. Then I just looked at some, uh, and I believe this is last year's data on uh, Michigan's website. Uh, this is total rabies cases. So this would be wildlife species, domestic species, everything. There was 50, 56 total confirmed cases of rabies. Now on average, and this is true nationwide, so it'd be true in Michigan. If we talk about 100 positive rabies cases, usually about 92 to 93% of those are wildlife species. And about, you know, six to 9% of those are domestic species. And the most common domestic species typically year on year are cats that come down with it. Cattle probably next. And then, you know, horses are right down in that list too. Equine rabies is not common, but there again, when it does occur, a lot of potential for human exposure and it is 100% fatal. So these are just a, an area here, or you can look at it on a county by county basis on where a lot of the, the rabies um, cases were uh, came from. And then if we look at the core diseases in whole, so these five diseases we've been talking about each year, and this is based on USDA data, we went back and looked at, at the government data and we kind of took an average for the last about five to 10 years. And if we look at that, about 400 horses die every year, 394 is the average, about 400 horses die every year 
from one of these core diseases. So more than one horse a day dies from these five diseases that we've just discussed today. And that should never happen because the vaccines are very effective. And if we get those horses properly immunized, it's just so very rare for them to come down with one of these diseases. And I was asked to, to just spend a couple of minutes on some reportable equine diseases in the state of Michigan. Each of, you know, I know folks are, are on the, the webinar tonight from all around the country, and you can get online and see these at your home state as well. But these are some, and these, these lists are certainly not complete. These are just some of the diseases I pulled out that you would have familiarity with. So these are diseases that are to be reported within 24 hours of knowing that they have occurred or been confirmed, and that's rabies in horses. And then equine herpes, myeloencephalopathy, or EHM. And that's caused by equine herpes virus type one. And again, that's a long name, but the myeloencephalopathy, well, instead of itis, we've got opathy, which means pathology or damage too, right? But again, it's a disease of the myelo, which is spinal cord, and encephalo or encephalitis, the brain. So another disease of the spinal cord and brain, but this, kind, this time it's caused by equine herpes virus type one. Equine infectious anemia, most everyone is familiar with that. And that, you know, the test we use to detect that is, is called the Coggins test. Everybody's familiar with the Coggins test. We have to have those to travel, you know, interstate typically. And it's actually named after a Dr. Coggins who invented the test for equine infectious anemia, but another reportable disease. Another one is equine arteritis virus or EVA, equine viral arteritis is the name of the disease. Again, it's not a common disease, but it causes respiratory disease as well as it can be a very, very important cause of abortion in pregnant, naive, or unprotected mare. Another uh, disease that's reportable that some of you may be familiar with is a disease called pigeon fever in horses. And then a few more diseases. That these are what we call monitor diseases, but they're to be reported within seven days of occurrence. And that would be some of the diseases we've talked about some of the other diseases we talked about this evening, West Nile virus, Eastern and Western or sleeping sickness and strangles. And so we are going to uh, have some comments about strangles here. So strangles, it's a bacterial disease. You know, we get strep throat, right? That's a streptococcus type of bacteria. It's different than this one, but it's in that same family of bacteria, the streptococci. And so we call it streptococcus equi, subspecies equi, don't worry about that terminology veterinarians refer to as, as strep equi. That is what causes strangles. Very, very contagious disease, especially in young horses. But it's interesting, if you go back in the literature, the first really reported case, as it was described, it was perfect for strangles, was back in the 1200s, 1251, by uh, uh, Jordanus Rufus in, in Europe. And he, you know, in ob observing this and seeing how it was transmitted from horse to horse, seeing those cases and the clinical signs, he surmised that it was somehow passed from one animal to another. And think about that thought process in the 1200s, pretty sharp guy, especially if these horses shared water buckets. And so that issue has not changed for what? Over how many years? Several hundred years. Water buckets still a very common source of uh, infectious disease transfer for respiratory disease of all kinds in horses, especially strangles. So the clinical signs, many of you have seen a horse with strangles. These horses, you know, they just get terrible snotty nose. Many times their lymph nodes will swell and rupture, drain pus. They'll run a fever. They become very depressed, very lethargic. Uh, just those are the classic signs of a horse with, with strangles. And those lymph nodes, when they rupture, as, as well as all the stuff coming out of their nose, is very infectious. It's laden with these strep bacteria. And so it, uh, it's one of the few disease few diseases in horses where we can see 100% morbidity rates, not mortality rates, not death rates. But what I'm saying is if you had 100 horses that were susceptible and this disease was introduced into that group of 100 horses, you could see up to 100% of those animals come down with clinical signs of the disease. And there's very few things, very few infectious diseases that will do that, but strangles is one of them. So I wanna walk you through how this might look. Uh, you know, a horse picking up strangles and then transferring it to another animal. So they pick up the strep, strep equi either through, you know, orally or through their nose, 
Uh, really, they could even pick it up through their mucous membranes of their eyes. And then it goes to some tonsillar tissues back in the throat, and that's where it kind of colonizes and sets up housekeeping, okay? Then the immune system moves it from that, that tonsillar tissue into the local lymph nodes, either back here in the throat or underneath the jaw. And they begin then to, um, to replicate, the bacteria begin to replicate in those lymph nodes. And many times they will abscess and drain. And there again, like I said, all that drainage is laden with these organisms. So that's another route then of the spread of the disease. And then this ruptured lymph node, sometimes these lymph nodes rupture into a structure in the throat on each side of the horse called a guttural pouch. It's a blind pouch. Some of you have heard of that structure, but it's a blind pouch back up with inside the, the, the angle of the jaw or the mandible on each side. And those abscesses will rupture into that structure and it's just a perfect place for that just to sit there because we don't get good drainage out of those pouches many times. And if that pus, if that horse does not clear it, that pus will dry and will get these little, almost look like little rocks of what we call dried or inspissated pus. And they are a chronic source of infection for strep equi. And that horse, it may recover and look completely normal and it may shed that organism out through the nasal passages or the mouth um, for intermittent periods of time to months to years. They can become a true silent carrier or typhoid, typhoid merit of this disease. And so, like I say, in, in a small percentage of the cases, this abscess material remains in the guttural pouch, forms these chondroids or these little rocks, and then they are a chronic shedder to other horses around them, okay? And here's what this just might look like. This is looking right into the throat of a horse right here. Uh, on either side are the openings into the guttural pouches, and you can see they're draining pus out of these guttural pouch openings. And this is looking actually on the inside of the guttural pouch, and this is an enlarged lymph node that's getting ready to rupture and drain right into that pouch. So that's kind of how that works. Now, the thing we need to remember, these horses, even if they recover completely, they still may shed the, the organism for up to six weeks after they recover from disease. And that's without the chronic carriers. This is just a horse that's going to completely recover. Not all of them do, but you, you, you wanna treat them like they're all, gonna, they're all gonna shed that for at least a month, at least a month after they've been infected and some of them much longer. And this organism, uh, it can live in a, like a, a water trough, depending on the ambient temperature, but it can survive in a water trough for about a month, for about 30 days. So you can appreciate uh, the infectivity of that organism. Prevention, <laughs> new horses coming onto a place, onto a farm, onto a barn, you don't have much history on them, you wanna isolate them for a minimum of three weeks. And that way, if they're incubating the disease, then they'll actually show signs of disease before you introduce them into the rest of your population. And you can keep them isolated and do your best to keep them from transmitting that to another animal. And I said, it can live in a water source for about 30 days. Vaccination, the vaccines are not perfect, but they are very useful. The vaccines will prevent about 70, 75% of that disease. But even the horses that are vaccinated who may come down with the disease, they have a less severe form of the disease and it's for a shorter duration. So the vaccines are definitely helpful. Basic biosecurity and vaccination. And so with that, I'm gonna shift gears now. I'm gonna talk about vaccination here just briefly, just some of the expectations or things that I want that I talk to horse owners about when it comes to vaccination. The first thing is I want you to talk to your veterinarian. I, and obviously I'm gonna be biased, I am a veterinarian, but I think it's critically important to have a veterinarian involved in your vaccination program for your horses. And there's lots of more things than just that syringe and needle that goes into protecting your horse from disease. So in other words, vaccination without good management, you're going to be disappointed in the performance of the vaccine. And what do I talk about when I mean good management? Just good horse husbandry, biosecurity, some of those things, um, good nutrition, parasite control, uh, even proper farrier care, just keeping their feet in good shape so that they, you know, their feet aren't sore. Any stressor in these horses' lives can impact their ability to respond to the vaccination. So good husbandry, good management is also very important to get the best 
performance out of the vaccine possible. And there again, we talked about this a little bit with the Strangles vaccine. Vaccination is gonna minimize risk of infection, but it's not gonna always prevent it. There are no vaccines that are 100%, right? Um, there are very good vaccines and these core vaccines are in that very good category, but they're not 100%. In the primary series, most of the vaccines we use in horses, the first time that horse ever sees it, it, it requires two doses. There, there are a few exceptions to this, but most of them require two doses. Give them the first dose, wait three to four weeks, give them the second dose. And then many times we will boost them on an annual basis or on a yearly basis. Or some of them we even may booster like flu and herpes, which we're not talking about tonight. Some of the risk-based vaccines, we may even booster them every six months just to help keep their immune status up uh, where we want it to be. But we need to vaccinate them properly, according to what the label tells us, and we need to do it in a timely fashion. If it's time for your yearly horse vaccine booster and you're on the big show going that weekend, and so you head out on a Friday afternoon and you stop by the vet clinic on your way out and say, hey doc, big show coming up. Can you, can you give my horses a booster here on the way to the show? That's not fair. That's not fair to your horses because they require a little bit of time for the immune system to respond to that vaccination and develop that protective level. So appropriate timing is always important as well. The other thing we need to remember, all the horses within the same population are not gonna be protected equally. If we lined everyone up that's listening to this tonight and vaccinated every one of us with the same flu vaccine and then waited two weeks and pulled a titer and looked at, looked at a flu titer, looked at our response to that vaccine, it would be highly variable. And that's a normal variability within a biological population. And we will see the same with horses. Now, most, you know, it's a typical bell curve. Most of the animals are gonna be within that bell curve and they're gonna have a good immune response. There are gonna be a few outliers. There are gonna be a few that respond extraordinarily well. And then there's gonna be a few that don't respond as well. So we need to understand that not every animal responds the same and protection is not immediate. And I already alluded to that one. And then the intervals, again, those booster intervals, very critical. You need to get input from your veterinarian on when, because he or she knows best how you manage your horses and they know the disease threats in your area. So they are the expert. But all said and done and all the other things we've talked about, vaccination is the best tool for prevention. Proper expectations after we vaccinated horses. I wish I could get a show of hands and ask how many are listening tonight who've been vaccinated against COVID, and I have. And if you have, you may or may not have had some secondary side effects from vaccination. I did. I didn't feel well after vaccination uh, on both doses. I got two doses, and I was very lethargic, and I had body aches, and I had the chills for about 12 hours, so my temperature was, was fluctuating. And that's normal. That's telling you the immune system is responding. And so if we see that when we get COVID vaccinations or a tetanus booster, things like that, the same thing is gonna happen in our horses, right? So we shouldn't be surprised if 24 to 48 hours post-vaccination, the horse is a little lethargic or it's a little sore at the injection site, right? All those things are normal. So local swelling and or injection site, that, that's to be expected. They may develop a fever for one or two days, typically a low grade fever, but they may have an elevated temperature. They may have a little loss of appetite, just feel pump, be lethargic, lack of energy, and that is normal. That is normal. Now, not all horses will, just like all people won't when we get vaccinated, but that is an expectation that, that is appropriate. And then some basic biosecurity, and we'll wrap this up. Um, Anything we can do to prevent disease spread is going to be good. So we go to shows, number one, don't share things. You know, don't share tack, don't share brushes, don't share anything with horses outside of the ones that you brought yourself. Okay, not a good thing when it comes to potential disease transmission. Uh, little foot baths, these can be made for just pennies almost. Talk to your veterinarian. If you're in a situation where you want to reduce, if you've got a sick horse in the barn and and you want to do what you can to help reduce that potential transmission or carrying that pathogen from one area to another. Hand sanitizer, great to have when you go to shows and other uh, places. Washing your hands after you've done things with your horse, great idea. 
washing your hands after you've gone and maybe interacted with a friend of yours and their horses. Do the best you can not to track anything back to your animals. Don't share tack, don't share water buckets, any of those things. Dipping the hose in the end of a bucket. How many times have we at a big farm seen someone, and I've done it, run the hose into the bucket in the stall and then you go do something else and you come back, take that hose out, put it in the next bucket and do that all the way down. Well, if any one of those buckets has some strep bacteria in it, you've just infected every bucket in that shed row. So common sense things that we can do. Also, there's disinfectants that we can use. Uh, uh, your veterinarian could tell you those kinds of things and, and where to get them and how to use them appropriately. And then, you know, if one of our horses does get sick, maybe after a show or any time, and we've got a number of horses on the premise, we wanna isolate that horse as soon as any signs of illness show up. We do not wanna keep it with the other horses. We wanna isolate it and do our best job of whatever it's got to keep it uh, in that horse and its immediate environment. And again, I, I think we've, we've already hit on this, but don't use common water buckets or feed areas, twitches, lip chains, any kind of tack and daily temperature logs while you're away at an event, a great idea, great idea. Take your temperature. Ideally, you'd like to take it twice a day. You wanna take it first thing in the morning. That's the best time to get an accurate reading of your horse's body temperatures first thing in the morning. And that, with that, I've concluded that. And I'm, I've, I've got a couple of slides on vaccination recommendations. I, I kind of like to, uh, you know, not get into any details on vaccination programs because I like for that to come from your veterinarians. But um, however, however we want to do that, I've got a couple of slides on that that we can go over or we can just open up for questions and answers right now. Well, we've got a couple of questions um, in our question box here. We could start with a couple and, and okay. see how that goes, if that sounds all right. You bet. All right. Um, so a question from an anonymous attendee, what would be the indication to quarantine after traveling to shows? I can't imagine all horses coming back from shows be quarantined when they come home to the barn with other horses. What are your thoughts there? You touched yeah. on that a little bit. That's a great question. And, and when we talk about quarantine or isolating those horses for three weeks that I mentioned earlier, that's typically more likely to for a new horse that's coming in that is not part of your horse population on your premise, a brand new horse coming in. Uh, we, we really want to be strict about that three-week isolation, if at all possible. But horses coming back from an event, there's still some things that we can do. Uh, but as far as, you know, the parameters we're going to look at, number one, if those horses come back and they're showing any sign of abnormal health, and, and we're always worried about respiratory disease, right? That's, that's one of the most common things we can bring back. So snotty noses, coughs, those kind of things, that should be a, a red flag for us. And then taking that body temperature, taking that body temperature. And if that, you know, if that temperature starts to go up, you know, we want to put that horse someplace where it's not in contact with the other animals. Now, other practical things we can do, and it's going to really, you know, depend a lot on your operation, how many horses are there. You know, if you've got three horses total, not a big deal, right? If you've got 30 horses on the place and you just took five of them to a big show and you've been gone for a week and now you're bringing them back. Well, there are some things that we could do in that situation where you could maybe keep them in a separate pasture or paddock by themselves for a few days before you reintroduce them back into the general population of those animals. So just very practical, common sense sorts of things like that. But again, any sign of disease or elevated body temperature, we want to get those horses and, and do our best to separate them from the rest of the horses on the place and then have your veterinarian come out and, and check them out for you. So uh, just some really basic things, but that's something that all of us can do regardless of, of really how many horses or the type of operation that we have, I think. Good question. Okay, I've got one question here. So is there a recommendation for not stacking vaccines? For example, is there a certain period of time between receiving different vaccines? That's a great question. The short answer to that is no. However, having said that, there's always exceptions, right? 
And so the issue of stacking vaccines, that usually comes up for those individual animals where if we give them several vaccines on the same day, they don't get along with that well, right? And we talked about the normal expectations post-vaccination. So remember those. But these are for horses that go above and beyond that, right? So they're, you know, it really takes them out. You know, they're really lethargic for several days. They may, may run a high fever. They may really get abnormally sore where they're having trouble, you know, eating and drinking, those kinds of things. For those animals, those individual animals, we can separate vaccinations. There is no magic number on how many days to separate them. I've heard everything from a week to three weeks, from seven to 21 days, and probably somewhere in between. But if we're gonna need to do that with a horse, I want them, you know, whatever vaccine we give first, I wanna make sure that that horse has, you know, been through that first few day period, it's doing fine before I come back and give it another vaccine, okay? The issue, another, and I'll maybe pair off on, on that question, sometimes we'll get, get the, well, can I mix vaccine A with Mac vaccine B and give those on the same day? Absolutely, you can, so long as that horse doesn't have a history of very, what I call, overreacting to vaccination. And, and those are really a very small, small subpopulation of horses out there. So most of the time, we can give all the antigens that your veterinarian feels are appropriate on the same day. But in those instances where we need to move them, uh, maybe separate them out because it's just easier on the horse, we can do that. But, you know, we have to combine somewhere along the line what's practical, right? We can't come back every week and give, okay, now we're going to give tetanus. Next week, we're going to give Eastern and Western. Next week, we're going to give West Nile. Next week, we're going to give rabies. Just not really practical for, for you or the veterinarian. And so we, we have to strike a balance there. And, and there again, your veterinarian knows your horse, talk to him or her about it and say, what's the best way to approach, you know, and it's usually one horse that has this issue on a place or, or under your ownership that has these issues and you, and you can work that out. But in general, they're all gonna do fine with, you know, getting, getting all the antigens or all the, the vaccine components they need on the same day. Dr. Morgan? I'm going to announce uh, two more winners for you our time. Uh, we have Jean Calkins from Michigan and Judy Westernling from Massachusetts. So congratulations. Uh, we, we will be contacting you uh, within the week. Very good. And I, on this last slide, you've seen, you see my email address there and my phone number. And certainly I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you all have after this presentation in the days or weeks to come. So feel free to reach out to me on that if, if anyone would like to. We've got a couple more questions here in the boxes that, um, that we could take now. Um, so one more question for you. When would you suspect that a horse is a chronic carrier of strangles and how would a horse be diagnosed as a chronic carrier? All right, that's a really good one. Well, typically, uh, Number one, if they've had a you know bad case of strangles and they have a slow time recovering, that could be one maybe red flag for us that, hey, I need to watch that horse a little closer. But usually, unfortunately, usually what, what makes the light go off is that horse, and we may or may not have the history on that horse, you know, depending on how long you've owned it. But we've introduced it, we've, we've done something different with that horse on your place, or we've taken it somewhere else, and it's mixed with some other horses for the first time. And then within just a few days, we've got strangles in those other horses. That's usually how the light goes off, unfortunately. Um, but if that occurs, there is a way, and I've known farms that have had big time strangles problems, large farms, where every new horse that came on the farm, they screened them for strep equi. And what that amounts to, we, we have a little procedure where we run this really soft little tube up their nose. We take some sterile saline or sterile water and we flush that area all out up in their nasal passages. And then we capture that, we catch it, usually in one of those little red solo cups. And then we take that, spin it down in a centrifuge. We send it to the lab and they can evaluate it because again, remember that horse is shedding that organism and they will do two things. They'll culture it to try to grow the bacteria. And they'll also do a, a test, what we call 
PCR, which many of you have heard now with the COVID thing, polymerase chain reaction, a very sensitive test to pick up the DNA of that bacterium. And that's one of the ways, really about the only good way to screen those horses is to flush those nasal passages or the gold standard is to go directly into the guttural pouch, which is not easy, and flush the guttural pouch and take a sample out of it. And so that's the way that we have to do to screen and identify those horses. So it's, it's not without some, some labor and some effort to do that. Okay, I have another question. How effective are titers? Would this be a good alternative for horses that have a history of vaccine reaction? Okay, you know, that's a question that we get more and more. You know, and I think that really was the result of people begin to question the need to vaccinate their children. Well, can I just, you know, I've got one dose of vaccine, can I just pull a titer and see if it needs a booster? First of all, we need to understand that um, for many of the diseases that we've talked about tonight and many others that we didn't, we don't know what a protective titer is. So, yep, we can take a blood sample and we can get a titer, but we don't know what a protective titer is for West Nile. We don't know what a protective titer is for tetanus. We don't know what a protective titer is for Eastern or Western. We have a pretty good idea what a protective titer is for rabies and even a less, but somewhat of an idea what a protective titer is for influenza. We don't know what a protective tiger is for equine herpes virus. Maybe a fairly good idea what a protective tiger might be for strangles. So when you look at the big picture, there's a whole lot. In, there's a whole lot more that we don't know than what we do know. And so for the average horse, for the average horse, the vast majority of the horses out there, boostering them every year for many of the diseases that we've talked about, is the best way to protect them. And there's no long-term negative health uh, effects that we are aware of in the horse from yearly vaccinations. Now, again, we talk about that subpopulation, that small percentage of horses that are very reactive to vaccines. Yes, maybe we could look at titers and help determine what we should or shouldn't do with those horses. But keep in mind, West Nile tetanus, Eastern Western, um, equine herpes virus, we don't know what a protective tiger is. So we can draw it and we can get the information, but it still is not necessarily gonna indicate or dictate to us whether we should or shouldn't um, booster that horse. So as a veterinarian, I'm not always gonna default, I'm gonna booster them because it is so valuable in protecting that horse. But there are exceptions to every rule. If you've got a horse that's just terribly reactive, it, 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 if you get down to the point where the risk of vaccinating the horse is greater then the risk of contracting one of these diseases, if we don't vaccinate, then okay, I'm not gonna vaccinate that horse. But there again, that population of animals is very, very, very small. That's an excellent question and one that we get more and more all the time. Great, wonderful. We'll ask one more question here. Since we've had such an early spring, I'm assuming this is from Michigan, do you recommend vaccinating a bit early this year? Uh, certainly you can, because remember, we talked about how important timing is, you know, getting that in front of potential disease exposure. And so what are the three of those big five diseases we talked about are mosquito-borne, right? And depending on the weather, that will dictate when our mosquito season starts. So if we've got an unusually warm spring and we may have an early mosquito season, it's absolutely fine to start your vaccinations a little bit earlier. There again, talk to your veterinarian, see what he or she wants to do. But yeah, there is a little bit of latitude for us on when to start those depending on the weather. And, and that's heavily dependent on uh, mosquito pressure. And then also, you know, the, 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 the tetanus exposure, that's kind of there all the time. It really doesn't change much because of the route of exposure. But also with wildlife and rabies, we know that many of those vectors are most active in the spring. So there again, if we have a kind of a warmer spring, that activity may, be, may begin occurring a little earlier. So there again, a, a pretty good reason to maybe start our core vaccinations a little bit earlier in that year. 
Um, I would like to uh, take a little bit of time to um, announce our last two winners for tonight. Uh, and that would be Valerie Beamer from Michigan and Lucy Williams from California. So congratulations to both of you. And uh, hopefully we will see everybody uh, next week as well. Um, are there any more questions or are we, are we good? Do we yeah, we've got, we've got maybe time for just perhaps one more here. Okay. Um, and this is a, a slightly, slightly different topic, but also covering vaccines. Would the effect of the vaccines be the same for mules and donkeys? Short answer, we don't know. We assume so, but the thing you need to remember when companies like Zoetis and others that are out there, a lot of other good animal health companies making good vaccine products for you, we always test those in the target animal species and the target animal species are horses, right? USDA will not allow us to put any other species on those labels unless we test it in those species. And no one routinely tests our vaccines in mules, donkey, other equid species, right? And so short answer is we don't know. However, historically, we have many years of experience with all of these equine vaccines. They've been used for, for some of them for decades in donkeys and mules and other species. And we know that they appear to work very well. But the actual work, what we call the challenge work where we vaccinate them challenge them with disease to see how well those vaccines work have not been conducted in those other species. So generally the answer is we don't know, but based on our experience, yes, they appear to perform very much the same in those other species as they do in horses. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. Um, we will end our session for tonight. Um, if you have more questions, go to the My Horse University uh, Facebook page and uh, type them in there or the uh, MSU CVM Equine Health Day Facebook page. And you can type some, your questions in there as well and uh, we will uh, get those answered for you. And with that, Dr. Morgan, thank you so much for a very informative presentation coming uh, right in the nick of time for vaccination season. And thank, <laughs> and thank you, uh, MSU's College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, both faculty and students for organizing this series. And I also wanna extend a big thank you to our participants for uh, attending this uh, program and supporting our programs uh, in general. And I would ask you as participants, if you will, when you receive an email with a survey for this webinar, uh, if you can take just a few minutes and fill that out, that will definitely help us improve our future uh, educational offerings. So with that, thank you so much and have a great week. And we hope to see you next Wednesday, same time. And we'll talk more about nutrition. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.